uh, available within the next month for for those folks to get to start investing and, and helping with this effort. Thank you. Any other uh, comments? Yeah, I just wanted to add to what, what John said. Uh, yeah, Richard Wright, I chair the regional oh, board. Yeah. And I just want everybody to know that, that the members of the regional board are solidly behind this, and uh, we have, have just greatly appreciated the leadership that uh, Carl and, and John have shown. Um, we're not going to let go of it this time. <laughs> Try to keep this thing going. I've been involved in this stuff for about 15 years, and made and others longer than that, but. What we've seen over the years is that uh, from time to time, the state, state government, federal government get all excited about doing something at the border. And so there's this big flurry of activity, <laughs> and then other priorities come along, and so the state steps back, the Fed step back, and, and then another five years goes by, and then everybody gets all excited about it again. And I don't think that's going to happen this time. I really, truly think that we have the momentum and that Carl and John have put together the, the right team. Uh, there's a, a lot of involvement from the community this time, and uh, I think made it. I think it's going to work. It will. <laughs> I believe that. Thank you, and we, we certainly hope so. And I think with um, the economic stimulus money coming in, I think this is a, a huge opportunity. Yes, sir. Since the city took over cleaning the channel and dredging, I believe that was in 1994, who is responsible? Because the city can't get permits to dredge it. Who is responsible for issuing these permits for the city to dredge the channel to keep it clean? And why do they have just a limited time to do it? Why is those permits only issued for a short period of time? Like right now, the city can't even get a 401 emergency permit to clean the channel. We've got the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. They're here to answer that question, but we need to get them. But in the meantime, they're very active in our community and are willing to try to help in any way that they okay. can. So there, there's an open line of communication where we get that question answered. I've been talking to the city for five years. <coughs> I'm the Army Corps. If it's an Army Corps issue, I've talked to the Army Corps of Engineers, and they say the city doesn't know how to draw up a plan. So, <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> how to clean the problem. <laughs> so, where, 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 where do you fall? Where does the citizens fall in it? We're well, guys, you're getting flooded out. <laughs> and sir, can you restate your name for the record, please? Richard Tiny. I think it seems to me that um, that when you have a forum, we need to have to continue that conversation because one thing is when you when those types of issues are addressed in, in isolation, you know, over time, you may get the kind of result that you're it sounds like that you've experienced. Is the the significance of getting the people at all levels of these organizations bought into broader strategy? Uh, hopefully, means then that the direction and the uh, drive, you know, that causes people to look at these kinds of issues in a different way that, that may um, uh, produce a different result. And of course, we know nothing about the you know the intricacies of what you're talking about. Right. And speaking, I think that would be one byproduct of this process is to get the right the leadership and the right organization. So far, we haven't been able to do that. This, this is the first group that I have seen put together that is willing to sit down and actually work and try to get the problem resolved, not only here but in Calexico. Thank you. That, and that, that sounds like that endorsement counts for something if you've been arrested for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and they've got your, your blessing. It sounds like they're on a good start. And um, thank you, sir. And I, we have a representative from Senator Duchenne. Yeah, I know you're going to <laughs> Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, John Hardy with State Senator Jason Chichetti's office. Uh, let me start off by uh, saying on behalf of Senator, thank you so much for coming to our district, um, which we're currently in, and I hope that you continue to come to our district in Calexico and throughout the border region. Um, some of the discussions here today, as you guys all know, are all within the Senator's district, and we appreciate the fact that you guys are taking time to address these issues here. 
given that forum for individuals to speak their mind as well as to convey the issues. I'd like to thank the EPA as well as the Wild Coast and all the members here for all the hard work for bringing the issues to the center. And as John and Carl have said, you know, right now we have the opportunity, we have the state leadership, we have the state electeds, we have the federal electeds, we have the local electeds all on board willing to work behind this issue and you know, the support that you guys can provide, the local support, <laughs> it is all appreciated. And I just want to say thank you and uh, you know, please continue to listen to these issues because they are important to um, the residents, to the electeds here and keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Any other uh, comments, questions from the committee, from the audience? Quick observation, and I wanted to say especially great thanks to Senator Cheney. She's always been very, very helpful for all, all many, many issues, including agricultural issues as well. Um, we're doing an, a plan called Ag Vision currently, which is trying to create a plan going out to year 20, the year 2030 for the state of California. It was born out of the effort to try and create a, an agricultural concept out of the year 2025, 20, 2030 in the San Joaquin Valley. And what you're doing down here is a very similar kind of a process. You're dealing with a watershed, you're dealing with a energy shed, and, and also possibly a, we'll call, I'll call it a food shed. And uh, certainly there's a lot of excitement around food sheds these days in trying to create uh, a very reliable, predictable source of locally grown products within a 150 mile radius of large urban areas. I know that's a part of a solution when you look at what your vision is into the future. How can you be uh, protecting those opportunities, if you will, for food production? The energy shed concept, I think, is very exciting because it encompasses a lot of technologies that are just starting to mature right now. Um, your plastic problem. I'm, a, I'm aware of a company up in the Seattle area, for example, we mentioned this to some folks, that currently has a new process uh, that is about to be, uh, as I understand, is commercialized, where they're taking plastic, they are uh, basically through a compression catalyst process, a heat process, driving it back into crude oil, basically, and they've already been selling, as I understand it, uh, tanker loads of, uh, of basically old new crude, I guess you'd call it, back into the refinery system, and it's very high quality crude. So your, your, your problem with plastics and tires, interestingly, and they evidently can tread tires as part of this process as well, you may be sitting on a very valuable product here, and it just it encompasses inviting all these kind of folks down to give a presentation. Don't get caught up in the snake oil of new technologies, but there, there's a lot of stuff off the shelf being developed around the world that may suddenly fit your model of your, your predictable future here. And I think that's one of the most important things is when you can really understand your potentiality of what's a resource as opposed to what's a liability. And sometimes that liability can be actually a wonderful resource for you. And brackish water is a good example. Again, brackish water that you might want to take into a good desal process if you have a good cheap energy source somehow, whether uh, we're talking about cane sugar out in the valley uh, or uh, algae production, as you know, Interesting, one of the greatest places to grow uh, energy cane happens to be out in the desert. Because you have sun, you're able to turn the water on and off as you need it, as opposed to intermittent rains that ruin the sugars that go drive up into, a, uh, into the cane sugar. So you're sitting on some great natural resources that might be able, be able to be brought in with the technologies of the day that will really open up your future enormously. And if you have a cheap energy source out there in some of these places, suddenly the business opportunities uh, predictable energy source for business opportunities to step in as well. So I just, just as a paintbrush, it's great what you're doing here, and I look forward to anything we can do out of our department if you have to help work with you. Thank you very much. Well, I'm struck with the conversation. I'm particularly struck with the comments from the chairman of the regional board in terms of the experiences down here, the kind of the ebbs and flows, if you will, of the public process and how that how that emerged and kind of it seems like we're at a at a, at a critical juncture here. It seems, you, you, apparently you've had the conversation about kind of the overarching organizational structure to keep this process going to, to build the continuing political constituency to get kind of get, get, get these issues focused on, get, get, get the community on a, on a sustained basis focused on these issues. So, I, you know, where I sit, uh, Natural Resources Agency, we, we get involved in a lot of these types of issues. And so I, I would, my recommendation would be, we'd be glad to work with you, but spend a lot of time on that, that on that organizational structure, whether it's a JPA, whether it's a conservancy, 